Thank you, Bob. I don't know how many of you have been to CVS lately, but I went in and I bought one thing, and I got a receipt that was taller than I was. I was just shocked. I mean, what, what is this? And I started looking through it, and there were all these coupons. I don't know if you've uh, used any of those or not, but I didn't. I, I looked at them, and they all were dated, and there, was, there were specifications that you had to, to go through to use them, and I thought, I'm not going to use those, so I didn't redeem any of those. Now, that little example is just to get you into thinking about redemption. Because as we are looking through this series about how we're partners with God in this new creation, we've broken it down into several things. And and as we said, in June, we're going to talk about how God delivers and restores And in that, today, we're going to be talking about how God redeems. And we're going to look at it through the eyes of Isaiah. Because Isaiah is a man who, he was amazing. And last week we talked just a little bit about him. But he's one of the prophets that wrote things down. And so today we can look at his prophecies and we can see how he looked ahead with God's insight and saw things that other people were not seeing. And now we can look back on it and say, wow, God knows what he's talking about. And he talked through Isaiah. Now, redemption is what we're going to talk about today. And, you know, redemption is a pretty hot topic. If you look at some of the current things that have been going on in our media, David Baldacci has a book called Redemption. And then uh, there have been several movies like Shawshank Redemption, uh, Redemption Day, even 24. I don't know if you remember watching all the 24 series, but they had a redemption movie that was on 20, for 24. Uh, the Westerns have, have done things on redemption And even Joe Bonamassa, one of my favorite artists, uh, has an album called Redemption. So people have been thinking about redemption in different ways. But what does it mean? Well, if you look at the definition of redemption, it's, it's defined as the action of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil. Now, the other definition that we think about is the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. So you're exchanging something. A couple of definitions there. You know, we talked about Israel and Judah and the situation they were in last week. Israel had been carried off by the Assyrians. And the Assyrians were, were pretty rough people with Israel. And so the northern kingdom was just demolished by them. And then as Assyria started attacking Judah in the southern kingdom, they lost 46 walled cities to the Assyrians. And the only thing that stopped the Assyrians from taking Jerusalem was an angel of the Lord. And so things are not good. Now, you would think the Israel people, Israel, Israelites would think, you know, we're not doing things right. We need to change our ways. God must be punishing us. And, and I'm sure some of them thought that, but they just kept on in some ways that were really, really against God. And so the evil that they were doing was something that Isaiah talked quite a bit about. And he pointed the finger at him and said, look, You may be pretending to be religious, but Sodom and Gomorrah, you're almost as bad as they are. And the ladies, you you have fine stuff on, you, you wealthy ladies, but you're just like the wealthy ladies in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so he's really pointing the finger at at these people. And as he began to prophesy some of these things, people were saying, you know, things, you say things are going to get better, but how long do we have to wait? We as humans find it difficult to wait, don't we? 
You remember when you were a young kid, or do you have grandkids or kids that, that can't wait to get out of school? They can't wait to get their driver's license. They can't wait. Once they get their driver's license, I got to find the, the right person. Who, when am I going to find them? And they worry about it. And then they find that right person. Then we can't wait to get married. And then it's have kids. And then the grandparents are bothering them. When are you going to have kids? And then, you know, it just seems to go on and on like that. When are we going to retire? And then when we retire, when are we going to go on the next vacation? What, you know, what? We have trouble waiting, don't we? Israel, Judah was in that same situation. You tell us it's going to get better, but when? We are in misery here. We are in captivity. You know, we talked last week a little bit about God's time. And sometimes our time seems so long, and looking at it from God's perspective, maybe that's not so long. But here's something to think about. While we're waiting, God is working. While we're waiting, God is working. So things are being done. God is working on different things, but, you know, it's tough for us to wait. So the prophet Isaiah, he's hearing from God. He knows things now that are 150 years off. That's a long time to wait. I mean, people are going to die. New generations are going to come in. And still waiting. In fact, Isaiah made a lot of predictions. Now, these came true during his lifetime. You know, he was, he was alive from about, or he was active from about 740 B.C. to about 700 B.C. is when he was making these predictions. And some of them were that Judah will be delivered from Assyria and Israel. And Syria and Israel will be destroyed by Assyria. And Assyria will invade Judah. And Philistines will be subjugated. And Moab will be plundered. Egypt and Ethiopia will be, will be conquered by Assyria. Arabia is going to be pillaged. Tyre will be subdued. Jerusalem will be delivered from Assyria. And Hezekiah's life will be extended 15 years. Those things came true while Isaiah was living. So they didn't have to wait 150 years for those. So they began to see Isaiah's telling the truth here. He's, he's actually hearing from God. And God knows what he's talking about. And this one was particularly interesting when Jerusalem was saved by the, from the Assyrian attacks by this angel and he said, but the Babylonians will be destroyed. There's not even a Babylonian kingdom yet. So he's talking about something that's going to happen in the future. And the, the neat thing is, the Babylonian empire did happen after this. So we can look back and see Isaiah was hearing from God and God knew what he was talking about. So the Babylonians took over all this area, even down into Egypt. And Babylon became the center of this ruling nation. But you know, Isaiah talked even further than that. And he named by name a king called Cyrus. And Cyrus was going to be king over even a larger area. But when he made these predictions, I don't think Cyrus is even born yet. And he's saying that Cyrus is going to actually capture Babylon. He's going to take over the Babylonian kingdom that's not there yet. So he's making these predictions way ahead of time. And that Cyrus is going to do it. And he names him. That Babylon's going to be in perpetual desolation. And he's going to conquest, he's going to conquer the, the world as they knew it. And so here's Cyrus the king of Persia, the king of Anishan, the king of Media, the king of Babylon, the king of Sumer, the Akkad, king of the Lord, four corners of the world. So Isaiah is predicting this. 
Imagine being able to listen to God and to, to hear that. Okay, well, let's look at what Isaiah said in chapter 49 of Isaiah. We're going to look at, at, at this whole chapter here, the first part of it. And so we're going to go through chap, uh, verse 13. And there are some uh, sections of Isaiah that talk about the servant of the Lord. And so I want you to focus on that for the next uh, 30 or 45 minutes. The servant of the Lord. The question is, who is it? Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. He made me into a polished arrow, and he concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. Now, when you back off and you look at all these servant uh, passages that Isaiah has, it draws into question, who is he talking about? Who is this servant that's the theme throughout all these different chapters? And so, scholars have been looking at this for a long time, and they want to know who it is. Is it Isaiah that he's talking about? Or is it all of Israel? Or is it Jesus Christ, the Messiah, that he's talking about? So they, they argue about this. And in fact, what the conclusion was that, that the scholars came to was that Isaiah wove these together. That actually he's talking about some of the things will be Israel... And some of the things will be the Messiah that's coming. And so you have to look at the context to actually see which one he's talking about as we go through these. So who is the servant that he's talking about? But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is the Lord's hand. And my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has made, been my strength. He says, and this is important here, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob. And bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will make you a light for the Gentiles. That my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. That's talking about Jesus, the Messiah. And Isaiah is predicting something not just 150 years from then. But 800 years, almost 800 years from then. That's going to happen and it's going to be monumental and it's going to change the world and, and actually make a new creation that we've been looking at. For this is what the Lord commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the entire ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says. As we go on, this is verse 7 of Isaiah. The Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see you and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Now, what happens next in here is this beautiful picture, this beautiful prophecy of salvation. So they've been waiting for salvation to come, and it hasn't. 
Israel has been beaten down. They've been captured. And they've kind of given up on God, it seems like. And, and they've looked at other gods. And so here Isaiah paints this beautiful picture of salvation. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor. So here we're talking about God's time. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. In the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritances. To say to the captives, come out. And to those in darkness, be free. They will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. There's so much beauty in this to the people of Israel. Because when you are a captive, to be free is something. It's something to be treasured. We have our freedom. But I've, I've actually picked someone up at Huntsville Prison. And I know Mike's been in the prison and seen people that have been there. I picked up someone who had been in prison for 14 years. And they came out after waiting all day to be released. And when they were released, they came to my vehicle and said, let's get out of here. Let's go, let's go, 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 go. I'm afraid they're going to come get me. Every day they've been telling me what to do. Walk over here. Don't go there. Now you can take a shower. Now you can eat. You're finished eating. Get back to your cell. And finally, you have freedom. Freedom for someone who has been in captivity is amazing. And it's a scary thing to be captured and have somebody's thumb on you. So this is beautiful to them. Be free. Come out and be free. And in this second part, I mean this last part here, they will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. Remember, there were shepherds here in Israel that, that maintained sheep. And they're always looking for a place where the sheep could eat. And a lot of times the hills were barren. Maybe they're up higher and... and the grass doesn't grow as tall. And he's painting a picture here that they're going to be eating on those barren hills. In fact, he goes on and he says, They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. We're feeling that right now, aren't we? When you go outside and you feel the, the heat beating down on us. If we didn't have air conditioning, we would be a little miserable in here right now. People would be fanning, right? We'd have the windows open, but we don't have windows. So it would be hot in here. And we feel oppressed when we are hot like that, aren't, don't we? I woke up in the middle of the night last night, and for some reason I was hot. Man, I'd throw the covers off, try to get under the fan. So it's very uncomfortable. So not, he's talking about something really pretty here for them because they didn't have air conditioning. He who has the compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. We carry it around with us, but have you ever been really thirsty and not been able to get water and suddenly your energy is zapped you know, these are beautiful things he's talking about here. Excuse me while I take a drink. And I will turn my mountains into roads. Now here, uh, I just had a message from my youngest son, Tyler, that he just got back from Colorado. And they climbed a 14,000 foot mountain and it is hard. I know some of you have been there. And when you get up 
at that high altitude, it's hard. Now imagine if you had to cross mountains just to get to somebody that you needed to get to or something. And crossing that mountain wasn't for your pleasure. You weren't going up there to look around and see how beautiful things are, but you had to get there. Well, he's talking about, I will turn all my mountains into roads. So he's talking about making life easier for them. And my highways will be raised up. A lot of times in the desert, the low, the low grounds, the, the roads would be ditches almost. And sometimes that would be rough for them to get their uh, wagons through. So raising up the road, make it smooth. So they will come from afar. And here, this picture that he's painting is people coming from all over the world. Even from Aswan. From the north, from the east, from the west, the south, all the people will be brought in to this redemption that he's talking about. So as he's painting this beautiful picture of redemption, of salvation, of freedom, I think we should bring that down to our level. And we should talk about what it means for us and how it makes us feel. I know how it made them feel when they hear about this prediction that they're, and, and they know that he's been predicting some things that have come true, and, and now they're hearing that these things are going to happen. You would think they would shout for joy. In fact, he says, shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains, for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. We've been redeemed. We have what Isaiah was talking about. And in a little bit, I know there's going to be some people singing in there in the auditorium that are going to be shouting for joy. And don't you feel that every so often? You're singing one of the songs that, that Dean has, has brought in there for us, and all of a sudden you just feel like you're overcome with emotion. I feel that every, every so often. And, you, you know, you almost want to shout for joy because God has redeemed us. So what does it mean to be redeemed by Jesus? What does it mean for us to be redeemed by Jesus? Give me some ideas. I'll repeat them so they can hear us online. Relief. Relief. Oh, yes. To know that sins are weighing down on us, that we have all this burden that we're carrying and that, that Jesus Christ has washed us clean. Remember, remember baptism when you were baptized and you came up out of the water and there was that relief? I did it, but he did it. He did it for me. Relief. I like that. What else? Give me another word. Uh, one way to look at it is declared righteous. Even though in reality you're not righteous, you're declared righteous. We are actually declared as righteous. We know we're not. But because of Jesus, he's told us we are washed clean. We are declared as righteous, as white as snow. Because of Him. So that's amazing. Joy. Joy. And, and that's something that a lot of people don't understand. They understand happiness. You know, watching uh, Top Gun 2 or whatever it is. I've, I've heard some people say, this is the best thing in the entire world. You can see they're really happy about that. But did it bring them joy? No. They go back to their regular life and and things are the same, but they can try to think about Top Gun, but it's not the same as being cleansed and feeling that joy that God gives us because we know we are saved. Humbled. Humbled. Yes, we didn't do it ourselves. This is because God did this for us. And so that brings us to humility. Well, I've got a few words that I've I collected here, but 
I, I, I've got these scriptures that I want to go through first. In Galatians, in Corinthians, in Hebrews, in John, and in Matthew, it talks about that we've been redeemed by Christ. And what does it feel like? Well, I was crucified with him, and I live by faith because Christ now lives in me. Christ lives in me. And then, because of Jesus, I want to boast in nothing else but boast in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, I have been given eternal redemption, secured by Jesus Christ shedding his blood. And I will not perish, but I'll have eternal life. Now, even as the, the Son of Man came to serve and not be served, but instead give himself as a ransom for many, I think we need to think about that servant term, and we need to look at that a little closer, because Jesus, Jesus was a servant king. And when we look at that, and we think about people here on this earth, there are some people that are servant leaders, and they try to emulate what Jesus did in some ways. And as I was teaching managers at Northrop Grumman, I would constantly remind them that they needed to be a servant leader. But what is a servant? Who have you known that's been a servant leader? Let me tell you one person that I knew that impressed me right off the bat. His name was Randy Raybeck. Randy was uh, the CFO of the company that, we were, that I was working for. And we would often work late hours, and he was always asking what we needed. And then I, I just have this image in my head of us sitting in a conference room, probably about 10 o'clock at night. We had all been there uh, late. He had ordered some food, put it out on the table, and then he was going around pouring tea for everybody. And it was like it was his mission to make sure we felt needed, comforted, fed, but that was just one instance because he was like that all the time. You had a boss like that or known someone that was a servant leader? Anybody raise your hand? Yes. You've had servant leaders. Tell me about one. Yeah. Those little things like a principal just picking up the trash or, or actually taking the custodian's place to, to do the lawn. I mean, that is, that is something that shows the heart of a servant leader. Beautiful example. Thank you. And, and contrasting that against a normal uh, person that's in charge, that those things are beneath them. Uh, you know, that's a big contrast. I don't think 
that Jesus uh, would have passed by that trash. And so when you, when you look at the way Jesus led people and the way he served people, the way he washed their feet, the way he loved them, the way he gave his life for, for us and them, uh, that is a true servant leader. Yes? Steve, I don't know an elder that we have here that's not a servant leader. I, I agree, except, you know... I won't call it, any names. <laughs> as, as we sit in, in our meetings and we... Uh, we there, well, we talk about it often that this is an eldership that really is cohesive in following Jesus Christ. And we don't have agendas that, that are going back and forth. And so we really, we really do have a good eldership. And thank you for, for bringing that up. And so servant leadership, those characteristics are something that are very valuable as we, as we look at that. Now, I want to look at a few of those characteristics. Integrity. People can trust that servant leader because they know they do the right thing and, and they're not hiding things. They're not just superficially saying one thing and yet doing another. You know who they are down deep inside. They have integrity. And then the second one is humility. They're not above everybody else, but they're with them and they're on their side. And they're humble enough to know that they can't do all of this stuff without all these people. That's one thing that, that I really enjoy about a, a servant leader when they recognize what each individual in the company is bringing to the table. And they recognize them and they reward them because they know they couldn't do it by themselves. They need all these people. So humility. Flexibility. Being flexible enough to, uh, when, when they encounter something that's out of the ordinary, to be able to handle that. But that also ties in with resilience. Maybe you're beat down as a leader, and yet you're resilient enough to get back up and to continue on leading. Because not everything goes smoothly. And stewardship. Not only with money, but also with time and with the resources and the people that you have. So being a good steward is very important for a servant leader. And then the last thing here is being able to look through the eyes of the people. Having empathy. I think Isaiah was able to do that. He had empathy for the people. He came down hard on them with his words, but he also knew that they were struggling. And so he's giving this picture, this beautiful picture of salvation and redemption that they could have hope. And so seeing through their eyes, he knew that they needed that. Okay, we are drawing to the middle of this look at Isaiah. And as we are talking about being partners in this new creation, we've looked at how there was destruction. We hope that we have resilience enough that when we're put down or in the hospital or have COVID, <clears throat> that we are resilient enough to continue on and to have that hope in that, that Jesus Christ is going to support us. One more second. We're going to also look at how God's people are going to prosper. Now, next week there won't be any Family Life Center class. <coughs> so, you won't be in here, but you will be in the auditorium, and VBS will be beginning and so there will be a class. Don't forget there's going to be a great class for the adults during VBS. So if you bring kids or grandkids up here, be sure to stay for the uh, class that's going to be for you. And uh, let's see, 
after, after we uh, have the VBS class, then we'll talk about how God's people will prosper. And then the last part of Isaiah is going to be Edmund talking about deliverance. How he, he saw the deliverance of not only his people, Israel and Judah, but he saw the deliverance of us through Jesus Christ. So Edmund will take over at that point. And I just want to leave this with you. <clears throat> it's personal. Isaiah was talking about a people, but he, his people, but he was also talking about everybody in the world coming together and being redeemed. So let's shout for joy that we are redeemed, that Jesus Christ did this for us. What you just said, only I'll phrase it a little different. One of the things I thought about with redemption was family, belonging. You know, you know, we're a part of something because we've been redeemed. Amen. And isn't it a beautiful thing to be a part of the church, to be a part of the body of Jesus Christ? And I love the way Terry Wilson sits on row two. And he turns around and looks at everybody. Have you ever seen him looking at you? And Terry Wilson does that. I'm a little shyer than that. I, I, I turn around sometimes and look. And, and every time I do, it's like I see people I love. And, and it's a wonderful thing to be a part of this body and a part of the overall body. Even when you go to a church somewhere else, were we all recently? Muriel, yeah. Germany? Did you go to a church in Germany? Went into some churches? And you feel God's presence there. Uh, we have been at churches, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, in different parts of the world, and we feel the love of, of our father, brothers and sisters in Christ. And I know you've been there too. And then when you go in a church like that, you see how someone has loved God enough to build those amazing churches to, to worship Him. And so, yes, I agree with you. So it's an amazing thing to be redeemed and part of this body. Okay, let's bow for a word of prayer. And then next week we'll have the VBS class. Our Father, thank you for bringing such joy to us and such a sense of belonging in your church. Thank you for having a sense of time that is way beyond us. Thank you for washing us clean and redeeming us from the, the lives of sin that we would otherwise be living. Thank you for showing us the way through Jesus Christ. Thank you especially for Pleasant Ridge. Father, I ask you to bless each person. Guide them. Show them your love through each other. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.